Yeah. I'll say good morning to everyone. We're starting recording here, so go ahead. Um, they they use the straws and the spectrometry interchangeably during during our meetings. Oh, uh, there's even a book on this. It's yeah. it's okay. It's related, but it's not this. In my opinion, it's not the same. Okay. So we were talking about the uh, what the Germans call uh, Scots deflectometry, and I claim that. It's not exactly the same. It's a, well, it's a cousin again. Not even a brother or a sister. It's a cousin, I think. Anyway, we're talking about testing of ACERs. Oh, we have uh, homework due on Tuesday. I should mention this before I forget. So I'm giving you four problems. And I have to admit, when I made this up months ago, I knew that there would only be two problems due on Tuesday. The other two is on material that we will cover on Tuesday. And so you don't have to hand in the solutions to SE3 and SE4, but they're both on MTF. One of them's even on MTF and shearing interferometry. And these are topics that I absolutely love. So not only will we talk about them on Tuesday, you can expect to see something on the final exam on that. So well, these two are not don't have to be handed in. My strong advice is to do them anyway. You don't have to hand them in. Just hand in the uh, two on aceric testing. OK, so we're finishing up uh, aceric testing. And the last item I wanted to talk about is on stitching interferograms. And the idea here is that we're going to perform a sub-aperture test of uh, asphere and going to do it you know, many sub-aperture tests, and then we're going to stitch them together. And there's going to be, there's a trade-off between overlap between interferograms, number of interferograms, uh, and how much overlap you have. I mean, the more overlap you have, fewer number of interferograms. Uh, the more overlap you have, the, the greater the number of interferograms you have to take. Um, but if you don't have enough overlap, you're probably not going to do a very good job of stitching them together. And this technique is really much easier to describe than it is to obtain accurate results. And I know I had one, one uh, PhD student, uh, C.J. Kim, who did his dissertation on this. And I'd have to say we never got results that I really liked that much. And there's lots of papers out there on stitching of interferograms. And um, the problems we had are, are rather common. Now, there's a, a company, there are two organizations now that are claiming they get good uh, results using stitching interferometry. Uh, one is the National Physical Laboratory in uh, England. They, they claim they have developed software that works well for stitching. And I, I don't know, I've not, uh, I've not seen their results, so I can't say for sure. The other is a company in Rochester uh, called QED. And uh, a person from QED was here last year and gave a talk. And maybe some of you listened to the talk. And it was, was rather interesting. And they're, they're saying they're getting good results using stitching techniques, even for the testing of A-spheres. And um, so I asked them to if I could have some of their slides. And I have to admit, I had to ask them several times for some of their slides. And I finally got them. And I didn't get very many. And the slides are maybe more like a commercial than they are technical. So anyway, I guess I'm giving a commercial for QED. But I have absolutely nothing to do with QED. Um, so anyway, they make uh, machines for uh, fabrication of optics. And they have some very, very good machines. And built into their machines now, they have the stitching capability. And so the idea here is here's the interferometer that's built right into the, the uh, fabrication machine here. And here's the A-sphere. And they're going to make several um, measurements of this aspheric surface. And you can kind of get an idea how much 
uh, overlap they have, which is, is quite a lot. And I think from the experience we have had with it, you do want uh, quite a lot of overlap. Now, I think, you know, and they, they claim this works very well. And I think the one, the, the really big advantage they have here is that they know precisely where things are. And so when they, you know, they do a measurement and then they move their optic a distance and do another measurement, they actually know how far they move it, what direction they move it. And I think that is, uh, in my opinion, that's part of the, of the secret uh, for being able to, uh, to do stitching interferometry. And they might stitch, you know, 100 or more apertures together with a lot of, a lot of overlap um, and uh, a lot of redundancy, some least squares fitting there. And they are claiming they can test A spheres up to a couple hundred waves of, of departure. Now, this is, I don't know, part of, I mean, this is their slide. And I didn't have anything to do with it, but it's just showing um, taking a, a measurement and then moving things and making another measurement and so on. And I guess we do another one here. Now, the other thing they're doing, which I like, is that, you know, this, this is a spherical wave. Well, as I show it here, it's a spherical wave coming out of here. And they're uh, measuring this A sphere. And the spherical wave probably doesn't match the A sphere too well, especially as you get off axis. So what they're doing, and this is something they started doing, well, I knew about it, I've known about it for a year or two now, not sure how long ago they actually started it. But in the beam here, they put um, these two wedges, and they vary, the, they rotate one of these relative to the other one. So that gives them a, you know, they can change the amount of, of wedge here by doing that. And then they also tip this thing, and I guess you can see that on the, on the right here. They can tip it. And so the idea is that they are producing, producing a partial null lens here by um, using this uh, variable wedge, tipped. And so um, I guess this first is trying to look at the interferograms uh, without, any, any, uh, without the wedge in there. I mean, so many fringes, and you know, you're not even getting the light back here is what we're seeing. And then they put the wedge in, and they rotate it and tilt it and stuff to try to match the surface as much as possible. And so, again, when they're, when they're doing the measurement, it's not a null test, but they want to minimize the, the fringes, or what I really should say is they, uh, it's not minimizing the fringes as much as it is a slope of the departure between the wavefront coming out of here and the surface that they're trying to minimize. And they, I mean, all this is, uh, um, uh, they have encoders here, so they know how far they tip it and how far they rotate it. And so they know precisely what the wavefront is coming out of here. And of course, that is essential for doing the data reduction. And so I think, I, I truly do think they have quite a, uh, um, quite a nice system here. And um, if you go to some of the trade shows you go to, they will have a, a system set up at the trade shows. And um, uh, I, th I think uh, I think it really it really does work uh, over quite a wide range of of aspheric surfaces. Now, I mean they have a, a number of people worked on this, but the guy who probably has done more than anyone else on solving this problem is a man by the name of Greg Forbes. And I have to say, I first about 30 years ago I spent a month in Australia. And at that point, I met Greg Forbes. He was just completing his PhD. He didn't have it yet, but he was very close to completing it. And I was very, very impressed with Greg. And so we got him to come here for a period of time once he got his PhD. Unfortunately, we didn't have a faculty position for him then. So he left us and went to Rochester, well, places. But going from Australia to Rochester, he didn't stay in Rochester too long. A few winters, and that was enough for him. And he's back in Australia now. 
But he still works for QED, which is a company in Australia, but he, he does, the, does the work from Australia. And he has come up with some polynomials that uh, he calls Q-type polynomials. And uh, there are a couple of different forms. Have, have you seen Q-type uh, polynomials in any other classes? Yeah, okay. And uh, uh, so they define the surface. You know, you have a set here that it's really um, characterized by the determining the slope. So the RMS slope can be easily calculated. And remember when we're testing an A-sphere, it's really slope that makes the, the difference. And then the other ones uh, really are, are looking at the departure. Um, like Zernike's, these are orthogonal over the pupil. And uh, I just, I gave one of his uh, references here. And I think that um, uh, it, certainly, if you're going to be involved with A-spheres, you should do a little reading up on Q-type polynomials. I'm uh, organizing a summer school for, in China for next August. And uh, so I've invited Greg Forbes to be one of the speakers. And I have to admit, I'm, I did that for very selfish reasons. It's a chance for me to learn more about uh, his Q-type polynomials and more about his, uh, his stitching techniques. And um, so anyway, that's uh, stitching. As I say, it's easier to, to talk about than it is to actually perform with any accuracy. So in all of, regardless which technique you use for um, testing A-spheres, you really, you need some type of analysis software, a, a Code 5 or ZMAX or uh, whatever your favorite program is. And you have to, you know, you, you have a lot of optics in your test setup. You really have to know how these optics change the wavefront that you're measuring. And you always have some misalignments. And you have to know uh, rather precisely what the errors are due to these misalignments. The basic uh, limitations of aceric testing, I mean, you regardless what type of test you have, you have to get the light back into the interferometer. And that was, I mean, that was, oops, very clear right here. I mean, they're, they're having trouble here, certainly getting the light back into the interferometer. And that's one reason why they went to these um, wedges here. So whether it's an interferometer or whatever it is, you have to get the light back into the test setup. You have to be able to resolve the interference fringes. And you have to really have to know what your optical test setup is. And that's often something that people forget about. And that's really the most serious problem. But anyway, that's a little bit on testing of, of A-spheres. So let's go on unless you have any questions. And we'll go on to ah, one of my favorite topics here. What I call absolute measurements. I think back uh, many years ago when I taught this course the first time, I said, "Well, you can't, you can't test anything, can't measure anything better than a reference." But that's wrong. That is no longer true. And what we're going to do in chapter ten here is that we're going to talk about ways of performing measurements that are better than a reference. And of course, if you can do that, then maybe you can make a better reference and bootstrap your way up. And so I, I call these absolute measurements. Um, we're going to talk about doing these uh, measurements for flat surfaces, for spherical surfaces, and for surface roughness. And of course, all these techniques here involve computers. And it's going to turn out that um, at least two of the techniques we're going to talk about here are really quite old. Uh, but it used to be they weren't very useful. And they involve taking several measurements and then processing this data. So you need, you need computers to do the processing of the data. But when you're taking several measurements and you want to finally get good results at the end, each of these measurements has to be performed 
very accurately. And that's where phase shifting has come along and has helped things. So um, going to make measurements more accurate than the reference. We're going to remove system aberrations and reference surface effects and going to give us better measurement accuracy. And as I said, we're going to talk about three cases, flats, spheres, and surface roughness. Now, the flat surfaces here, of the three that I'm going to talk about, I have to admit, this is my least favorite of the three. Because what we're going to get here will not be the overall shape of the surface. We're going to get the profile. Uh, of the surface, and we're going to get a couple of profiles, or we can do, you know, keep doing the measurement over and over again and get many different profiles. But we're not getting the whole surface in, in one measurement. And if you look in the literature, you can find um, papers uh, other that will describe other techniques of measurement of flats. In fact, I guess I have one out there on that. But these other techniques all assume something about the errors. They assume that they're only even errors, or maybe they're assuming they're only odd errors, or something. They're making some assumption. And the technique we're going to talk about here is going to give us only profiles, but we're not going to make any assumptions about what type of errors that it's going to work with. So let's say I, I have two flats. And I, I think they're flats, I'm not sure. But I put them together and I get straight fringes. And so, do I know they're flats? No, I don't know they're flats. Because one could be concave and the other one's convex. All I know is that the two surfaces match. So just having two surfaces, I can't tell if they're flats or not. But if I have three surfaces, I can tell. Because if I compare A with B, A with C, and B with C, the only way that I can get straight fringes with all three of these measurements would be if they're all three are flat. So if I'm going to do an absolute measurement of a flat surface, I, I need at least three flats. Um, so let's say I have three flats. I'm going to call them A, B, and C. And I'm going to do the Fizeau here. And I'm going to compare A with B. And so this, these two surfaces closest to one another that we're comparing. Now when I put B on top of A, I'm flipping it. So if this is X, you know, when I flip it over, that is my X here. Okay. And when I compare A with C, again, you know, the, the X here is going to be inverted for C. And then I'm going to do B with C. You know, I only have to do three comparisons here, but I always like the number four, so I'm going to do four comparisons. So I'll do B, you know, A with B inverted, A with C inverted, B with C inverted, and then I'm going to do a B rotated with C inverted. So C inverted, X goes to minus X, and when I take B and I rotate it 180 degrees, x goes to minus x, but also y goes to minus y. Okay? So that's the difference here. And the reason I'm going to do 4, not only do I like the number 4, but I'm going to end up getting two profiles. If I only use three measurements, I'd only get one profile. And by just doing one more measurement, I can get another profile, so why not? So, oh, it's all messed up on my screen. But there it is. Okay, so A with B. So I'm measuring surface A and surface B, but as we said, X went to minus X. A was C inverted. We get A and C, but X goes to minus X. B was C inverted. We get B and C, but X went to minus X. And then we did this BC prime, I call it. So in BC prime, we rotated B. And so X goes to minus X and Y goes to minus Y. And for C inverted, X went to minus X. So if 
f of a, you know, is a surface height variation for flat a and so on. Uh, in these four measurements here, gab, gac, gbc, gbc prime, this is what I'm measuring. Now, if I go through some algebra, and I'm, I'm not going to, it's actually a pretty simple algebra, but I'm not going to do it here. But I know that all of you are going to go back to your office, and by 10 o'clock this morning, you will, will have checked my algebra. Well, maybe 10 o'clock tonight, I don't know. If we just do a little algebra here, we can see that the X profile for surface A is given by, so I have these four measurements, given by GAB, X, where Y is equal to zero, just X profile, GAC minus GBC prime. And then I have to divide that by two. And that is giving me the X profile for flat A. And the errors in B and C have dropped out. And it just follows right from just putting in y equal to 0 here and adding and subtracting. Um, you'll get this. So that's pretty nice. And I can get the same thing for flat B. You know, GAB, X profile, minus GAC, minus, uh, plus GBC prime. And I can get the same thing for flat C. Um, you know, minus GAB plus GAC plus GBC prime over 2. And if I want the Y profiles, I mean, it's a very similar calculation. <coughs> Just put in X is equal to 0, get the Y profiles, and I can end up with the Y profiles for A, B, and C. And, you know, you can plot these out if you want to. Nothing very, nothing very exciting about it. But the great thing is that, you know, the, you're doing an absolute measurement. You're, you're canceling out the errors in the other surfaces, and you're getting only the X or Y profile for, um, for what you want. Yeah, so then you have to keep repeating this. So I have the X and Y, and then I can rotate, and I can you know, do more and more, but it's um, uh, tedious at best. And uh, then awfully hard, you get all these profiles, you like to connect them together to get the uh, whole surface. That's, uh, I don't know how to do that, because you always have some tilt and stuff in there. That, um, so you really just get profiles. And as I said, if you go back and look in the literature, and I, I can't remember if I put any of these up on the website or not, but um, there are other techniques, but they always assume something about the, the surface. Uh, and here we, we're making no assumptions. Now this technique, I, you know, I don't know who invented it first. It, it's invented long before I was born. I mean, this has been around forever. But um, it really wasn't that useful until phase shifting came along. Because you really need, you know, to get high accuracy here, you really need high accuracy in, for these individual measurements. And that's where phase shifting came along. So I, I have another technique here I'd like to propose to you for measurement of flatness. And this technique would give me the whole surface without any assumptions. And I want you to tell me what's wrong with this technique. So what, what's wrong with this? So I'm going to take, I don't care, Twyman Green, laser base Fizeau, whatever. I'm going to measure a flat in it. Okay, just normal setup like we've seen many times this class. Then I'm going to move the flat a small distance in the horizontal direction and make a second measurement. And I'm going to subtract these two measurements. And all the errors coming from the interferometer for the two measurements are common. And they will subtract out. And we're left with, well, it looks like, you know, the equivalent of a lateral shear interferogram for the flat. So do you understand what I'm doing here? Any questions on it? Because there's going to be, there's something wrong with this technique. You're going to tell me what it is in a minute. 
So I'm measuring a flap, move it sideways, take a second at measurement, subtract the two, errors in the interferometer drop out, and I end up with something like a lateral shear interferogram. And then I'm going to repeat that for shifting not in the x direction, but now shifting in the y direction. And so I'll get a lateral shear interferogram for in the y. So I have slope in x, I mean something very close to slope, and slope in y. And I can analyze these two lateral shear interferograms to determine what the wave front is. So what's wrong with that technique? Why, why don't people just do that? What's wrong with it? I don't know if I should tell you or not. Make you think about it. Any ideas? Why don't we just, we'll, we'll start a company measuring absolute measurements of flats this way. Very simple, just go to 4D, we'll buy a Fuzzo interferometer, and we're set up and in business. Maybe have to write a little software to analyze lateral shear interferograms, that won't take long. Any ideas? I don't know if I should tell you or not. Well, okay, I'll give, I'll give you a hint, okay, give you a hint. Because I was, I mean, there was a time in my life, I was really excited about this. It lasted for about a day, and then I realized what was wrong. When I move this flat sideways, either for the <coughs> X shear or Y shear, or maybe both, I might tilt it a little bit. I mean, I don't want to, but... When I'm moving it sideways, and I hate mechanical things, and some way I might, it might tilt just a little bit. What would that do to my results? Yeah, how would it change? A, a tilt in a lateral shear interferogram, what would that show up as in the final measurement after I go from slope to wavefront. Yeah, curvature. A little, a little tilt here in the lateral shear interferogram. Now when I analyze this, you know, to find the wavefront, I'm essentially taking the integral and the tilt linear term will give me a quadratic term and it will look like curvature. And so if I have, if I end up you know, one of the biggest problems with a flap is it has a little curvature. It's not perfectly flat. And when I analyze this interferogram, lateral shear interferogram, if I end up with a little curvature, I don't know, is that curvature really in the flap? Or is that a result of just a little tilt when I translated my plate sideways? So if we have, we have any mechanical engineers here? None. Whew, that's good. Anyway, we need a good mechanical engineer, and maybe you can do this with an air bearing slide or something, I don't know. That some way, if I could really translate this, being sure that I don't tilt it any, this would work. But um, you'd, you have to assume that you don't introduce tilt in moving it sideways, and so that's, that's the real problem with this. Okay. Yes, over here and then, yes. <laughs> It's not fair, because <laughs> that could be removing curvature, you know, in the surface. You, you can't, you know, you, you can't tell if in the lateral shear interferogram is the tilt, what you see as tilt, is that because you tilted it, or is it because there was some curvature in your flat? Yes? Yeah, maybe you could do that, doing a lot of measurements, different amounts of shear, and and stuff, and, and maybe you can average it out. I mean, I, I love, you, you see more of that coming up here in a little bit, random errors, averaging, they average out. I mean, I love doing that. So maybe, you know, maybe you can, can do that. Um, 
I don't know. Anyway, I was excited about this for one day of my life, and, and I realized what the problem was. Okay, absolute sphere testing. Well, we have two techniques we're going to talk about here. Um, and these are both going to give us the, not just a profile, but it really is going to give us the shape of the sphere. And the first technique, uh, which involves three measurements of a spherical mirror, again, has been around forever. Um, but it's only since the days of phase shifting that it really has worked well. The second technique, ball averaging, is something that was invented here by, um, well, invented by Bob Parks. I'm not sure if he was actually here at the time. He worked at NIST for a while. It may have been while he was at NIST that he came up with this approach. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about both of these. So first, three measurements of spherical mirror. So, um, First, you know, it could be a Twyman green or a laser base for Zoe, I don't care which. But we're going to do a center of curvature measurement of this sphere. And I mean, I'm not determining the absolute curvature, I'm just determining whether it's a spherical surface or not. So we do one measurement here, and I call that W0 degrees. Then we rotate this 180 degrees. And this is, you know, the critical item. Again, we need a good mechanical engineer to have a mount. So I'm rotating this 180 degrees, and I'm going to do second measurement. And you might say, how close does that have to be to 180 degrees? You know, it really depends on the slope errors that you have in the surface here. But probably, I don't know, a second of arc or something like that. It's reasonable. So those are two measurements, so that's W180. And the second one, or third one, we bring this in either at focus, or maybe we just put a flat here. So now the beam goes in here, and it flips over and comes back here. So we're not seeing any errors in the surface now. We're getting errors here, but it's kind of weird, because it, you know, the beam goes through one way, and it's flipped over when it comes back. So that's the third measurement. So if I think about this for a second, what are these three measurements? W0. Well, I'm getting twice the surface. I mean, I'm reflecting off here normal, so I'm seeing twice the errors in the surface. And then I see the errors coming from the reference. You know, and I could have put a factor two there or something, but I didn't. It's just whatever errors are coming from the reference, you know, I, I just call that W ref. So I, I didn't bother to put in two that includes, maybe the two is included in here. And then twice the diverger, and I actually do mention going through the diverger twice, because later when we go through it, we're going to flip it over. So anyway, we're going through the diverger twice. So the first measurement, twice the surface plus whatever's coming from the reference plus twice the single pass diverger. What, W180. Well, these two are the same, W diverger and reference are the same. And what's different here is that the surface has been rotated 180 degrees, so x went to minus x and y went to minus y. So that's our second measurement. Then our third measurement. Um, well, I get whatever errors are coming from the reference, and I'm going through the diverger once, and I'm flipping it over. So I have W diverger for single pass, and then W diverger you know, flipped over, so minus x minus y. So these are my three measurements, okay? Now, if I combine these three, and I, I'm not going to go through the derivation here, I, I think I put these in Mathematica notes. I don't know if I posted them on the web or not, but anyway, it's a very simple calculation. That if you just combine these three measurements and you say, well, add W0, add W180, but I have a minus X minus Y here. So what, I, what that means is that in the computer, I'm rotating this data 180 degrees. 
So in the computer, I'm doing that. So W180 minus X minus Y minus W focus, this guy, minus W focus, but in the computer, I'm rotating the data 180 degrees. If you go through this and add these up and divide by four, you end up with the errors on this surface and all these other errors drop out. I mean, it, it's very, very nice. And uh, I've done this lots of times and it actually works. I mean, it works, works well. As long as, you know, as I said, this technique has been around for who knows how long, very long time. As long as these individual measurements are performed well, high accuracy, you end up here with something that is very good. As long as you can rotate this 180 degrees. That's it. I don't know, I just threw in some results here, Not nothing very exciting here. But. And while I didn't solve for it here, I mean, I could have solved for the errors. And um, so I only need to do this calibration once, as long in, unless something changes. And I can, uh, as long as I do the calibration once, then I can uh, measure lots of optics and subtract out the errors in the interferometer without repeating the three measurements. Okay, any questions? So I'm, I'm, I forgot to say this before when I was talking about flats. Um, you know, you might think about this. Maybe you can invent a way of measuring flats where you're getting not just a profile but the whole surface without making any assumptions about what errors are present. If you come up with that idea, I'd love to hear about it. And if you have other ideas for testing spheres, that's also would be, be nice. So we have a second technique for testing spheres. And as I said, um, I think this was uh, uh, idea came from Bob Parks. And I, I said he developed it while he was here, but I'm quite sure he was at NIST at the particular time he came up with this idea. But his idea is the following. People can make very good glass balls, turns out. In fact, ball bearings are actually pretty good too, but they can do better than, better than that. So what he says is, let's take a glass ball and we, we set it on something. He's, he set it on three other balls, but something that he can rotate here very nicely. And so now he's going to test the, the light coming from um, the interferometer. You know, you're going to put the, the glass ball right here. Okay. And he's going to be testing the optics in the interferometer. Now the glass ball is pretty good, but it's not perfect. And so what he does, he'll do a lot of measurements. A lot of measurements might be, I don't know, the number I always like is 16, but some number like that. And between measurements, he's going to rotate this. And so then he's going to average. And so he's averaging out the effects of the ball, sort of like your idea on the sliding flat will do a lot of measurements there and average out this error due to the tilt. But he's going to average out errors in this ball and end up with determining what the errors are in the interferometer and now he can test the spherical mirror he wanted to test. And I, I actually, I don't think I've ever done this, but I've seen Bob do it a, a number of times and it uh, seems to work. Seems to work quite well. And um, used to be a company here in Tucson, Torque, uh, used to make these balls. I don't know if, I'm sure there's other places you can buy them as well. So anyway, that's Bob Parks' approach. What else did Bob Parks, I mentioned his name one other, one other time in this class. The Hubble, he figured out the errors. Aaron Hubble. It's all because he and I took quantum mechanics and math physics together at Rochester as graduate students. I think that's why he has come up with these nice inventions here. Okay. Um, absolute measurement of surface roughness. Well, for you know, for 
So in 13 years, I ran WICO, and we sold uh, you know, thousands of these interferometers for measurement of surface roughness. And um, the interference microscopes, the reference surface in that, about as good as you normally got was about three angstroms RMS. And uh, sometimes people wanted to measure a lot better than that. And so you had to have a way of uh, calibrating the interference microscope. So there are three possible techniques here. Um, so, uh, you know, perfect mirror, maybe not too uh, practical approach, but if you had a perfect mirror, you could calibrate your interferometer, interference microscope. And the other two techniques, generate reference and absolute RMS measurement, are um, somewhat more practical than the uh, uh, perfect mirror. So what we're saying here is that I'm going to make some assumptions here. I'm going to say that the surface height is random. So we're not measuring a curved surface or something. We have something that's basically flat, but it has a, some random height, it has a roughness to it, random height variations. We're going to assume that the statistics do not vary over the surface. And of course, in each measurement, we're going to do a measurement. You know, you're really looking at the difference between the reference and the test. So we're measuring both of them. And we're assuming that these two are uncorrelated with respect to each other. And so um, let's say we, you know, how important is the roughness of the of the sample, of, of the reference, I mean. You know, and let's look at the case of where uh, I said, well, the sur reference surface has a five angstrom RMS. And you, you can do a little bit better than that, maybe three or something, but I just, I just kind of picked five here. And uh, so I guess, I, so what we're really measuring here is the square root of the sum of the squares of the surface roughness that we're measuring and the reference surface. And uh, we're assuming that these are random, uncorrelated. So we have a square root of the sum of the squares. So if I'm measuring something that is 30 angstroms RMS, and my reference has a 5 angstrom RMS, the error introduced by this 5 angstroms is you know, a fraction of an angstrom. Doesn't make any difference. But as the surface gets smoother and smoother, and of course, in the limit that the surface we're measuring is perfectly flat, we would have a five angstrom RMS error. And if we have a measuring a surface that is five angstrom, we would have about a two angstrom RMS error. So, you know, for many measurements, you don't worry about this, but as you become um, something closer and closer to say five angstroms, the effect of the reference surface becomes much, much larger. So, you know, perfect mirror, oh, this would be great. If someplace I could buy a perfect mirror, we could just use that, measure it, and any, any uh, you know, whatever we measured would be what's wrong with the system. And so we could easily calibrate the surface. But every time I try to buy a perfect mirror, it didn't, doesn't work too well. So let's look at more practical ways. So generate reference. What we're going to do is we're going to measure this sample many times. Okay. And between measurements, we're going to move the sample greater than the correlation length of the surface structure which is, you know, microns or so. So I'm just going to move this many, many microns and do many, many, many measurements of it and average all of these. So what I'm doing is I'm averaging out the errors in the sample that I'm measuring. And the effect of these errors, well, good, I'm assuming it's random. You know, it's going to go down as a square root of the number of measurements. So that's where I like the number... 16 for some reason now it goes down by a factor of four 
And what I'm going to be left with then is a measurement of what the errors are in the instrument. And then I can take one of these measurements and subtract these errors in the instrument and the result will tell me what's wrong with the surface. So, you know, here is a single measurement of something, a little profile, something here. And here is the average of, and I forget the number, but let's say 16 measurements, where between measurements the sample has been moved greater than the uh, correlation length of the structure on, this, on the surface. And then I simply take this, subtract it from that, and I have the RMS of the surface. In fact, I even have a profile of the surface. I get a profile plus an RMS. And the RMS for this particular measurement turned out to be 0 0.07 nanometers, 7 tenths of an angstrom. Okay. And this actually does work pretty well. You, you want to make sure that as you're taking your multiple measurements, nothing in the system changes. Like one common problem you have is that the reference surface heats up because the light source and the shape will change. You don't want that. So you have to make sure that everything is warmed up and uh, then uh, you can do your several measurements and average them to get the reference. Okay, so that uh, is the, the, oops, is the, get the right. That's the, what we call generate reference. This was a Moreau for this particular case. It was an interference microscope. And so it, it's probably either a Moreau, a Linux, or a Michelson type attachment. <laughs> And I think for this particular results, it was the Moreau interferometer. But this is, I mean, I should emphasize that this is micro roughness on a sample. And so this is looking over uh, 1.3 millimeters. This distance is 1.3 millimeters. And uh, the heights here are nanometers. And so it's 0 0.07 nanometers RMS. So, the last technique here is the following. It's what I'll call absolute RMS. So in a sense, I should go back. In a sense, this is a little bit like what Bob Parks is doing for the ball measurement. In fact, he said when he read our paper on this, that's what made him think about the ball and averaging out the errors in the ball. OK, absolute RMS. What we're going to do now is we're not going to take a lot of measurements. We're going to take only two measurements. And we're not, we're not going to get a profile in this case. The only thing we're going to get is the RMS. But normally that's what people are interested in anyway. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to make two measurements of a sample. And I'm going to, between the two measurements, I'm going to move the sample more than the correlation length of the structure on the sample, just like before. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract these two measurements. And so the errors in the reference is a, would be the same for both these measurements. So it's going to subtract out. And the RMS of what I'm measuring here is going to be too large by the square root of 2. And so we simply divide that. So the reference cancels out. We divide the result by the square root of 2. And that gives us the RMS of the test surface. Not a profile, mind you, but the RMS. And um, looking at the same sample we did before, this is what we got for generate reference. And remember, we got a profile here. But that's the RMS. Our absolute RMS, well, this profile doesn't really mean anything, but the number down here does. And RMS, they agreed. And typically, they, I mean, I, you always show the best results, but, but typically, uh, there was always good agreement between the two approaches. So this approach is nicer in that it requires only two measurements. Uh, it doesn't give you a profile, but it only requires two measurements. This requires a number 
a number of measurement, uh, 16, 32, or whatever. If your sample is on a computer-controlled stage, you just program it and does all the measurements, and you don't have to do any work. Um, but this is probably easier, and this is probably more commonly used. So we've seen a way to measurement, measure the profile of a flap, a few profiles of a flap, where the errors in the reference drop down. We saw a couple of techniques for measurement of a spherical surface, where the errors in the interferometer drop down. And now we've seen a couple of ways of measurement of surface roughness when the errors in the interferometer drop down. So I, I don't know. I, I just I think these are just uh, it's so much fun because it it's just you can do things can make measurements better than reference the reference and if you can do that then you can make a better reference probably and keep bootstrapping your 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 way up and. Uh, uh, I think it's kind of neat. Any questions before we go on? So I don't remember seeing any of you at the basketball game last night, did I? I mean, there were a lot of people there, so maybe I just missed you. I don't know. Do you remember who we played? NAU. NAU. Oh, what was the final score? oh I don't know. I, I said I, was, I would leave when we got ahead by 50 points, and at one point it was 48, and I almost had to leave, but then we put in a second and third. In fact, they almost asked me to play, I think. And, and uh, uh, we won by 40-some points. But we'll see what happens as we get to the tougher teams now. But it should be a good year. OK, so that's absolute measurements. So we're finally on our last chapter. So um, kind of sad I get to the last chapter already. Anyway, we've looked at, you know, looking at materials, finding how good the material was, and then we made components and we tested these components, mirrors and prisms and lenses and corner cubes and all kinds of things. Now we're going to put the system together and we're going to test the entire system. And we're going to look at several tests here. Um, resolution tests, what we call veiling glare tests, spread function measurements, encircled energy, and then we get down to the part that I really like best, the OTF measurement. So let's uh, first we'll, we'll talk about the first four here and then we'll, we'll go through them uh, fairly fast and then uh, the OTF will take more time. So resolution tests. This is another test. It's pretty old and still commonly used. It's um, a simple test. And, you know, you almost get the feeling it's not a good test, but the truth of the matter is it's, it is a pretty good test, widely used. So the idea here is we're going to start off with some resolution chart. And it may look like this. So we have different, we have you know, the three bars here with uh, different spacings for different groups here. And this is called the Air Force, uh, US Air Force resolution test target. And in here, there are, in each group, there are six targets. And uh, so if I look at the biggest group here, which I can see the best, you have you know, you have vertical lines, you have horizontal lines, so that's group minus four, uh, and target one, target two, three, four, five, and six. And between uh, targets within a group, the um, spacing changes by the sixth root of two. So why is it the sixth root of two? Well, well. Maybe we'll say something about that in a minute here. But if I look at the different groups here, I can find the spatial frequency of the lines in units of lines per millimeter by simply taking 2 to the g, the group number, minus 4, say, plus p minus 1. Well, if p is 1, p minus 1 would be 0. And then 
divided by 6 here. And that will give us, um, and so this would be p minus 1 will go to 0, so this would be 2 to the g, g is minus 4, so it's 2 to the minus 4 lines per millimeter for this particular group. So the idea is that you, you set up your optical system and you image this, and then some operator will look at this and look at what's the finest structure I can resolve. And you do horizontal and vertical because maybe you have some astigmatism present. So what's the finest structure that I can resolve? And you know, if we, all of you in the class did this, you, there'll be a little disagreement probably between what the finest structure is, but you probably wouldn't disagree by more than maybe plus or minus one target here in a particular group. And they picked this crazy sixth root of two because they, they felt that that was sort of what the, the smallest change was that a person could really detect. So this, you know, it looks, it looks like kind of a crude test. It um, depends a little bit on the operator. But it's still, you know, it works pretty well, and it's, it's uh, widely used. So if any of you, have you seen these uh, resolution targets? And you looked through a system and determined how good a system was by looking at these in the lab? Okay. Veiling glare. Well, uh, has anyone here done any work with veiling glare? Okay. Um, it's really, you're looking at unwanted light, and the unwanted light is causing a drop in the contrast of the image. And uh, they often call that veiling glare. And there's a lot of sources for this veiling glare. And, uh, you know, you can have multiple reflections between the surfaces of, a, of the lens. You can get scatter from the surface, from dirt or dust, or fingerprints, probably. Um, uh, if you have defects in the glass, you can get scatter from that, or cements uh, holding pieces together, you can get scatter. Sometimes just from around the edges of the lens elements or the lens mounts. Um, or you can even have uh, cements that fluoresce and so on. So lots, lots of sources of this unwanted light. So how do you how do you measure it? We used to have a, I think it was Bill Wolf when he was a faculty member here used to have a, a setup of this, and it's basically um, you have an integrating sphere. We'll show a picture of one in a second, or a light box or something, and you're going to have an area that's going to be very dark. Maybe use velvet or something. And you um, essentially measure how much light you have at, this, at the uh, center of the image of this black area uh, compared to either you replace the, the black area by something that um, um, is bright or you just look at a neighboring point and you take the ratio here and that gives you an idea of how much um, what the so-called veiling glare index is. And you often, instead of using just a small area for the black, you might use a strip so you can measure um, veiling glare at uh, a few points across the field of, of view. So I guess this on the left here is um, um, an integrating sphere where we have some light sources here. And we have our lens system looking in here. And then there's a dark area, the velvet, or, or some type of a, of a way of, uh, of making this black here. And you look at, in this case, you, you generally would look at the brightness there compared to a neighboring point. Or maybe this is replaced with something that was the same surface area as the rest. And so that's uh, veiling glare. Now, as I was putting these uh, notes together this summer, I saw an article, which I had not thought about measuring veiling glare of a display before, but that's also a very common thing. And I saw this article in Applied Optics. It was kind of interesting. 
of just looking at a display where you have a, a, a dark spot here and then bright around it. And uh, the same idea of, of measuring the veiling glare for that display. And put a dark area in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. quite a, it's quite an interesting little article there a few years ago. The next thing is um, spread function measurement. And so we have a, a point source, sort of I think a little bit like a star test here in a sense, but we have a point source and we Nowadays, if I'm going to measure the spread function, what I probably would do would be to use a CCD to look at this image of this point source. And, you know, maybe I have to magnify the point spread function, and then I have to worry about the optics used to magnify it, the errors coming from the, from the optics. And or sometimes instead of measuring for a point, I might measure for a line, get the line spread function. Um, yeah. I mean, I probably, you know, we, we talk about measuring point spread functions using a CCD and there are at least a couple of companies that sell instruments for doing this. But another common way is if we're doing an interferometric test is that we can just determine our wavefront, and then we can what take the Fourier transform of the wavefront and square that, and that will give us our point spread function. And uh, I, I kind of make points down here that this technique works well, but it has to remember first off we're sampling the wavefront with our interferometer, although getting more and more detector elements now, so we're sampling more and more closely. And so um, frequency components higher than sampling frequency will be absent. The other thing is we have to think about here is that this is using generally a, a single wavelength. And uh, maybe we're interested in what happens uh, for a broader line width or a white light source. And that's where actually measuring the point spread function using something like a CCD might be a, uh, gives you something closer to what you what you're really looking for. And then the next thing here is um, to um, want to measure encircled energy. So now we, we have our point spread function and we want to know how much light is within given different diameters. If I have a, a, a good airy disk, I forget the number, how much light is contained within the central core of the airy disk? 84%, very good, A plus, 83.9 right? or something like that. Okay, so um, we again we could get our image on a CCD and um, we could uh, measure how much light is within certain diameters. Um, now, there, it's always the, the problem that comes up here. You know, if, if this is a symmetrical point spread function, um, it's pretty, you know, so essentially we think how much light is getting through a hole of a given diameter. And if this is a rotationally symmetric point spread function, there's no question about where we put the, the um, center of the hole that we're measuring how much light gets through. But if it's not rotationally symmetric, now as you open up the hole, the question is, do I keep the center of the hole fixed or do I move the hole around to get the maximum amount of light going through it? And so, you know, if that's a spec for a system, you want to make sure that you specify whether it's a, um, whether you're going to keep the center of the hole fixed as you open it up or if you're allowed to move it around to maximize the amount of light going through the center of the hole, or going through the hole I should say. Okay, so that's encircled energy. 
So that takes us here to uh, the optical transfer function, the last topic here. <coughs> and this is a um, I think you, you've had OTF in what 505 or maybe other courses as well. And so um, the, the OTF consists of two parts. It, it's really saying that if I take uh, an object and I have a certain contrast in the object and I look at different frequencies, sinusoidal, sinusoidal patterns, and I image these sinusoidal patterns, what's the contrast um, of the image compared to the contrast of the object? And so the the ratio of the contrast of the image to the contrast of the object is what we call what the MTF, the modulation transfer function. But the optical system may take not just the, the uh, reduce the contrast, but it may actually shift different frequencies. And the amount of shift depends upon what the frequency is. And so the phase of that or uh, well the amount of shift gives us a phase associated with the optical transfer function. So in general, maybe you need to measure both the MTF, the modulation, and the phase uh, of the OTF to uh, see what the shift is for different frequencies. So what we're going to do, and I'm, I'm going to wait until next class to do this, and we'll do it all at, at once. We're going to talk a little bit about just what the OTF is, go over that real fast, although I think you uh, you've had that in previous courses, so we can go through it fast. And then we're going to look at three different ways of determining the OTF. There will be a scanning method where we're simply are imaging targets and, um, and then scanning them, determine the modulation. There's going to be the interferogram analysis. So what we, we take the interferogram, we find the wavefront, we do the Fourier transform of the wavefront. That gives us the amplitude point spread function. We square that to get the intensity point spread function. And then how do I, how do I calculate the OTF from the intensity point spread function? Remember that from 505 or whatever? Ah, another Fourier transform, right. So and then you just do another Fourier transform of the intensity point spread function, and that gives you the OTF. And that's a, a, a very common way of, of calculating the OTF nowadays. Another technique, which I love here, is the autocorrelation technique. And that's going to be essentially using a, a lateral shear interferometer to um, calculate the OTF. And what we're going to do here, we're going to derive something that will show that if I take a lateral shear interferometer and I have a certain shear present, if I measure the amount of light in the overlap pattern, uh, well, say I have a, a shearing interferometer and I vary the phase between the two interfering beams, and so the, the intensity in the overlap region will go light, dark, light, dark, that the amount of light there, the modulation of this, will give me the MTF. And what we're going to show is that a lens forming a, an image is nothing but an interferometer. So that's going to be pretty cool. But I'm going to wait until next class to go through these three methods. So that's, I guess, everything I'm going to cover today. So next class, don't forget, you, you hand in two homework problems. The other two you don't have to hand in, but after we do the next class, you'll be able to do these problems pretty easily. And uh, I think you should do them before the final exam. I still have this big pile of papers that I keep carrying back and forth. And I'm about ready to throw them in a waste paper basket. So if you have homework here, you might want to pick that up. So I'll see you.